Well, I'm so happy to, to be able to join you today. And um, and just a bit a bit of background about me, because it's in addition to the wonderful introduction that Dr. Myers gave me, I think it's important for you to know about kind of how I got into healthcare in general. Um, I grew up with siblings with disabilities. So my older brother has an intellectual disability and epilepsy, which inspired me to go into to healthcare. And then when I was 15, my then three-year-old sister was in a car crash and got a C1 spinal cord injury. So she's paralyzed from the neck down, trached and vented. And we had to move from our home on our reservation in Central Oregon to a town just off the reservation in order for my sister to get health care. <clears throat> and so I've kind of gotten to see from the, the family side of things um, kind of a, a complex disability. And that's the experience that um, moved me into becoming a pediatric physiatrist or rehab doctor. And so um, I'm honored to get to speak at the Duncan seminar. And I do want to acknowledge that I'm, I'm speaking today from Duwamish and Coast Salish territory. Um, and if you want to, if you're sitting somewhere else and you're interested in whose traditional territory you're on, you can go to the nativeland.ca website and find that out. You can look at that from um, any places around the globe. And I have no um, financial disclosures to share with you today. And just to start with, just for some um, terminology, differences between health disparities and health inequities. And so for health disparity, that just means there's a difference in health status or in healthcare status between population groups. And what makes that different from a health inequity is the inequity is when that disparity is due to a systematic difference or just systematic discrimination in social, economic, environmental, or healthcare resources. And so there's kind of social forces behind healthcare inequities or health inequities. So I want to talk about the health disparities and health inequities in cerebral palsy. So are there, are there disparities or inequities in who gets cerebral palsy? So a lot of the data for this comes from the, the Center for Disease Control's Autism and Developmental Disabilities Monitoring Network. Uh, there were four states involved with this, Alabama, uh, or, uh, Georgia, Wisconsin, and Missouri. This study looked at children who were born in 1994, 96, 98, or 2000. And here, the, the unadjusted risk of spastic cerebral palsy was 52% higher in non-Hispanic Black children compared to non-Hispanic white children, and 38% higher for all forms of cerebral palsy. Then when they separated out, uh, it out by socioeconomic status, there was a 93% increased risk of spastic cerebral palsy for children from low socioeconomic status groups versus high. After adjusting for socio socioeconomic differences, the risk of spastic cerebral palsy was still 35% higher for non-Hispanic black children than non-Hispanic white children in this monitoring network. But there was no difference when adjusting for, for everything, for the socioeconomic status, for preterm birth, size for gestational age, prenatal care factors, maternal factors, though maternal education still remained protective. But as my epidemiology professors talked about during my uh, health services courses, uh, when you adjust for things that are that are dis disparately uh, affecting the population, you're adjusting away for real life. And so always think about that when you're, you know, are, are we taking away the things that are really affecting people um, and their experience? And then another study that was done um, with actually a larger number of children, because it came from California, um, that looked at 6.2 million births. Uh, Non-Hispanic black infants were 29% more likely to have cerebral palsy than white, white inf uh, infants. But again, there wasn't any difference after adjusting for birth weight, but that's part of kind of the real life experience um, that still led to the, the non-Hispanic black children having a 29% more likely chance of having CP. So then are there disparities in outcomes for children who have CP? So again, that CDC four-state surveillance, surveillance system 
when they stratified by the severity of functional limitations, so they didn't use the terms GMSDS level, but kind of would probably track along the GMSDS levels. The non-Hispanic Hispanic black children were more likely than non-Hispanic white children to have uh, severe CP or have more disability from their cerebral palsy. And then a study out of Wisconsin, the regional cohort of infants who were born with very low birth weight, there was an association between health related quality of life and CP that was stronger for black children rather than white children. And amongst children with CP, even after adjusting for those socio demographic and prenatal factors, the black children still had a 31 point lower health related quality of life. And I know from you know, Dr. Narayan's talks earlier, health related quality of life is not the best measure, but it was what they had uh, to look at for this study at this time, time frame. And then looking at whether or not all children with cerebral palsy have equitable access to care. So the National Survey of Children with Special Health Care Needs from 2005, 2006, and 2009, 2010, uh, and this included both, patient, both people with cerebral palsy, but also autism spectrum disorders and ADHD. Uh, race didn't predict unmet therapy needs, but being uninsured or having increased functional impairment, increased, uh, increased amounts of disability did predict not having your therapy or your rehabilitation needs met. And then a study that I did um, a few years ago using audit methodology for outpatient rehab clinics in Washington State, 33 to 42% of the clinics were more likely to accept private than public insurance. And it's um, the, the difference is that the uh, physical therapy clinics were 33% more likely to accept private insurance and speech therapy clinics were 42% more likely to accept private rather than public insurance. And then the wait to get a first appointment was longer at those clinics that accepted public insurance. And the wait difference was up to six weeks difference um, in urban speech therapy clinics that accepted public insurance. And so there's not equitable access to rehab services depending on the type of insurance that you have. So, so what? So, you know, there are disparities and inequities for children with cerebral palsy. I hope we can all agree that, that health equity is the goal that we're working towards. Um, but so what? And before moving on to now what, I'd like to go back to our rehab basics, which I know the other, uh, many other people have talked about this a lot, so I don't need to go into detail with the ICF model, but that is what's underpinning kind of all of our work. But specifically, you know, the, the, the child-focused ICF model with the F, word, F words were fitness, function, friends, family, fun, and future. Those environmental factors and personal factors, the, the family and the fun, that's really the social determinants of health. And I know there's been a lot of talk about social determinants of health over kind of recent years. And now we're going to kind of go in more into more detail about those social determinants. And I'm using a model that's adapted from Dr. Kier Perry, who's a, a obstetri obstetrician gynecologist who's done work on um, maternal health inequities for black women. And so kind of adapting this model for children with cerebral palsy thinking about housing, you know, is there safe, affordable, accessible housing in a place where you can be physically active in a safe way? For a living wage, do your parents or caregivers make a living wage? Do they have to work multiple jobs to make that happen? Or is there an availability of an at-home parent or at-home caregiver who can spend more time with the child? For access to a quality education, you know, does the child with cerebral palsy have access to a school setting that can meet their needs? For healthcare, does the child with cerebral palsy access high quality healthcare and rehabilitation services? Are they able to get transportation to the care, pay for their care, and follow the recommendations from their healthcare providers? You know, is food available? You know, food availability is linked to the living wage, but also to their uh, available uh, the family's ability to acquire and prepare the food, 
and food that's safe for the child, you know, the includes tube feeds, different textures of foods, supplements, all of those um, things that, that we work um, so closely with, with our patients. And underpinning the social determinants of health are, you can't really get away from wealth inequities and wealth inequalities. And so this is from the 2019 Survey of Consumer Finances, which is a study put on by the Federal Reserve Board. And you can see that there's a massive uh, disparity or inequity in how wealth is distributed by race in this country. So you look at the median net worth, white families, it was like $180,000 median net worth compared to black families of, of about 25,000. And then you compare that to the mean net worth. And actually it is interesting, the mean net worth, it just shows how much income inequality there is in this country in general, because the average mean net worth for white families is close to a million dollars um, compared to about $175,000 for black families. So all of the, the 1% are kind of skewing that mean net worth, but there's still a, a, a massive gap in, in general wealth. And those, those wealth imbalances contribute to power imbalances as well. And so in the model from Dr. Kruger Perry, the social determinants of health are impacted by policies and structures that are impacted by power and wealth imbalances. So you know, housing policy, labor market practices, education. We're gonna go into uh, more detail for, uh, for, for some of these. And I want to start with housing policy. So first off, knowing for, for the importance of access, like accessibility for homes in general and thinking about you know, some of the families that we have who have to carry their 100 pound child up and down four flights of stairs if they need to go to an in-person medical appointment or if they want to get outside of the house. There's not that many accessible homes that are available. And so this is a housing and urban development study of data from the 2011 American Community Survey and of the housing stock, which is the kind of apartment unit, Section 8 housing, uh, publicly controlled housing, in addition to private apartment units, 33% of housing units were potentially modifiable for accessibility, meaning that they could have a ramp put in, um, you know, there weren't stairs between levels, but only 0.15% of the American housing stock was fully wheelchair accessible. So they're thinking, you know, kind of thinking about that as like, okay, so maybe, you know, renting is not the option. Maybe people should just buy homes and, and modify them for their use. Well, home ownership uh, is definitely impacted by, by race and there's big disparities in who owns homes by race at every age group. Uh, white people are much more likely to own homes than any of the other uh, racial groups. And so can't just tell people to go buy a house. And I think it's really important to think about why there's disparities in home ownership. You know, it's that racial wealth gap that we were talking about, uh, but it's also things like redlining, which, you know, is a practice that was outlawed with the Fair Housing Act of 1968, but but you know, those forces that were happening back then impacted the generational wealth development that impacts the non-white families. And so with redlining, the uh, mortgage brokers would draw a red line around areas of the city where uh, non-white families weren't allowed, and specifically black families, weren't allowed to get mortgages approved. And then thinking about uh, kind of other like home home ownership disparities. There are areas that people wouldn't get sold to. Uh, you know, there'd be racial covenants and you couldn't buy a, a house in that neighborhood if you were black. And then even today, um, there was an audit, like an audit, it was a case, an audit case. It wasn't a full study, but there was a black family who got their home appraised for a value that they thought was low for their neighborhood and for their home. So they, had it reappraised and cloaked their race. They, they um, had somebody else kind of stand in for them. And the person thought that the family who owned that home was white. 
and the home was appraised for $100,000 more. So that you can see how that impacts wealth as well too. And so these, these issues are not in the past. Other things that kind of contribute to both the disparity in home ownership and wealth is that there were there was unequal access to the benefits of the GI Bill. So, you know, for children who are born now, that's like their great grandparents or even their great great grandparents. But it kind of shows these generational effects from unfair practices in our past that are still having an impact today. And then unfair lending practices and predatory loans um, kind of in the, the subprime mortgage crisis uh, from 2008 um, disproportionately impacted um, black and, and people of uh, families of color compared to non-Hispanic white families. And so there's lots of social things going on with housing policy that impacts uh, families' ability to get homes. And having a home in a safe environment that enables you to, to be fit and have fun is, is important. Kind of moving back out to the, to the model, <clears throat> labor market practices, I think, are important to think about as well. And specifically with that, you know, minimum wage standards, they haven't changed in, in uh, 12 years. So not keeping up with inflation. When unions get unions get busted and health insurance isn't offered uh, because you're uh, considered a contractor, or you're in the gig economy, and then because so many of our children's primary caregivers are women and working and working mothers, gender pay gaps are a huge issue. And so I just want to acknowledge that women's equal pay day is coming up next week, and so uh, equal pay day is the day it takes women on average to earn what men did in 2020. So March 31st of 2021 is equal pay day for all women, but there's significant racial disparity, racial and ethnic disparities within that as well. You can see the dates here that it's August 13th for black women, October 1st for native women, and October 29th for Latino women. So almost two whole years of working to earn what men did in one year. For education systems, you know, thinking <clears throat> very much about how public schools are funded and whether or not the, you know, like individual education plans and, and <clears throat> services that are promised by the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, there's still so much um, variance and inequity in how those services are actually implemented. Thinking about you know, how public schools <clears throat> are funded at the county level based off of local property taxes. Well, if you're living in an area that has a high tax base, let's say, you know, the Queen Anne neighborhood of Seattle or Laurelhurst around Seattle Children's Hospital, there's going to be more <clears throat> funding than if you were in a more impoverished county. And then kind of beyond what's given from by the, the state for funding educational services. The power of individual parent-teacher associations just still boggles my mind. So I grew up, like I, I said, on the reservation. There was one school that we went to. You didn't have any choice. You know, starting in middle school, you were bussed off the reservation to the, to the middle school and high school, which was for the county. <clears throat> Nowhere else to go. I don't think that we had a parent-teacher association. There was a, a sports booster club, which, fundraised for sports, but not other things. Well, as a parent of a child in the Seattle public school system, my kids' schools try to raise over $300,000 a year for, for their parent-teacher association to pay for things like a full-time librarian or a school counselor, or um, and then supplementary things like art and whatnot. And you compare that to, you know, to schools in the same district who can't raise that much money from their parent teacher association and what are the children missing out on in then and so that's a boggle for me and then also just thinking about kind of a, again to the the inequities and in the implementation of IEPs thinking about the geographic disparities and rural urban disparities and so one of my clinical responsibilities and actually I shouldn't say responsibility because it's an honor to get to do it I have an outreach clinic in Alaska 
including at the Alaska Native Medical Center. And for our, my, my patients that are in the villages who have IEPs, um, you know, maybe once a quarter, a traveling physical therapist or occupational therapist will visit their village, but there's not any sort of ongoing service with that. And the, the, the classroom, it's a K through 12 classroom, usually with a couple of hundred students and not people, not a lot of people who can actually implement the recommendations. And then the other piece of the education systems that I want to, to, to just mention is the presence of the school to prison pipeline, where children who have kind of behavioral challenges um, in school will be kind of misidentified and put into this punitive carceral system rather than, than having their underlying needs met. And for the healthcare systems, you know, these are things like insurance and what Medicaid reimbursement rate is to get people to, to want to take patients with Medicaid. It's whether or not you can get your care in your preferred language. It's where the healthcare services are delivered. Um, and I do want to, you know, you know, give a shout out to like the Odessa Brown Clinic who's building their new space closer to the patients that they serve and planning on including rehab services in the that clinic space as well. It might not be services uh, geared towards children with disabilities, but at least they're going to be there. And that's so important. And then it's also important to think about whether or not families can have providers from similar backgrounds to them. And we'll talk about the importance of this in a bit as well. And then uh, again, with the injustice system, kind of similar to the school to prison pipeline, within the justice system, there's a significant overrepresentation of people with disabilities. And when you look at people who've been killed by the police, those, there's also an overrepresentation of people with disability, maybe not cerebral palsy, but you know, other types of disabilities um, in that population as well too. And so there's a lot of kind of forces and policies that are impacting those social determinants. And what's impacting those power and wealth imbalances and these policies, kind of the root causes, are the things that we've been hearing so much about over the past um, nine months to a year. So, you know, institutional and systematic racism, white supremacy, uh, gender discrimination, class oppression, extractive and settler colonialism. But I want to focus for a bit on ableism. Uh, I think that's something that's not talked about enough in the popular, um, popular media and just in the community in general. So uh, for ableism, I think a, a study was just published earlier this year looking at physicians' perceptions of people with disability and their health care, which, you know, you know, they surveyed a little over 700 physicians in the United States. They're from seven different specialties, family medicine, general internal medicine, rheumatology, neurology, ophthalmology, orthopedic surgery, and OBGYN. So not, not groups that would be as enmeshed with people with disability as rehab medicine or neurodevelopmental uh, pediatrics, but still groups that would be expected to work with people with disability, especially when you think that, you know, one in five to one in four people in the United States are thought to have a disability. Really all, all people, all physicians should know how to take care of people with disabilities, but it's another, another topic. So of these 714 physicians, 82% of them reported that they thought people with disability have worse quality of life than people without disabilities. And only 40% of the surveyed physicians were very confident that they'd be able to provide the same quality of care to disabled people. And interestingly, it was non-white physicians more, were, were more likely than white physicians to feel that they were very confident in providing the same quality of care. They didn't have enough of a sample size to further uh, kind of dive into that, but I thought that was an interesting finding from the study. So physicians, I, I don't think anybody would be surprised <laughs> to hear this. There's a lot of ableism within medicine. And this, particularly over the past year with COVID, 
has been very challenging because of concerns for rationing of care during COVID affecting people with disabilities. Um, and there have been some kind of publicized cases such as Michael Hickson in Texas who had a spinal cord injury and a traumatic brain injury was taken from his nursing home into the hospital with COVID and um, his treating physician had been had, had told the, the patient's wife that they were you know moving towards comfort care uh, because he and said that he didn't have much of a quality of life. And so and I know that this has been something that has worried a lot of people with disability and kind of kept them from seeking health care. I know with, with my own family experience, my sister um, had this wound on her head over the summertime and there was this thought that there, there was a worry that she was going to have to go into the hospital and have surgery and my mom was beside herself because she was like if she if Teresa if Teresa goes to the hospital they're going to take her ventilator they're going to take her ventilator and give it to somebody with COVID because this was when um, their local hospital was the, the ICUs were filled and so she was like, we can't we can't go to the hospital because they're going to take her ventilator. And I tried to like. Calm her down about that, but it, luckily my sister didn't have to go to the hospital, so we didn't have to cross that bridge. My, my mom was so sure that if Teresa went to the hospital, they would take her home ventilator and give it to somebody else. And then kind of another piece of, of ableism um, and kind of how it interacts with with rehab care and with with care of children. This is a quote from uh, the the dad of uh, one of my young patients who had CP, and he and his mom, the, the dad and the mom were were kind of disagreeing about the path forward, and they were they were asking what what I thought about the orthopedic surgeon's recommendations for a surgery, and the dad and this quote still st sticks with me, and it was. Six years ago, the dad said, you know, what if we do the surgery? And when, when you know, the, when he gets older, he thinks that we did it, did the surgery because we didn't love him enough to accept him the way he is. And kind of thinking back to Dr. Narayan's um, earlier talks, kind of what the goals of care are and when our kind of ableist thoughts get in the way of you know trying to make somebody more independent, trying to make them more productive, um, you know, improve it, you know, making improvements. That's with our biases about what's best. And so um, how do how do we just support families and loving loving their children the way that they want to express that love? So Moving back again to the, the 10,000 uh, foot view and thinking about you know, our ICF framework and kind of the, the approach that we take to the care of children, you know, flipped another way, all of our practices are balanced, rather imbalanced on these unjust, inequitable systems, policies and determinants of health that can feel out of our control. So I just want to share uh, another kind of framework or a, a visual series that was created last summer um, to think about inequality and inequity. And um, these these images are available from from Tony Ruth uh, at the website down there. But for inequality, you know that's unequal access to opportunities. And so for cerebral palsy, you know an example for that would be not everyone has access to health services and rehabilitation services. And so, you know, one, one side gets the proverbial apple. So equality would be when there's an even distribution of the tools and resources and assistance. So, you know, all this would be like all children with cerebral palsy have the same frequency and intensity of therapies, the same duration of treatments, uh, kind of get the same, you know, units of care. That still is leaving, you know, our, our poor little guy on, on the right without any apple. Equity is when those tools and resources are customized to address that inequality. 
know, this could be, you know, each child having a truly individualized and patient and family centered plan of care where their goals and priorities have been identified and are being addressed. But we also need to think about what justice would look like. So fixing the system so it offers equal access, equal resources, and thinking about, you know, what would justice look like for children with cerebral palsy? Would this mean that there's a, an overall reduced prevalence of cerebral palsy? That the, you know, the proportions of children with cerebral palsy mimic the, the, the racial and ethnic proportions of children within uh, the United States or within the, you know, the global population where it matches the general population? Would this mean, you know, everybody kind of recovering or habilitating, rehabilitating as much as they can? Or would it be more that they're accepted and valued and that they're safe regardless of their degree of disability? And I don't have an answer for this, but I just want you to, to, to think about what justice looks like um, for you. But because there's another important consideration using, using the, the apple tree as the metaphor, that not everyone wants to eat our apples. Not everyone has the same goals. And to further illustrate this, I'm going to share some images that I know you'll recognize, um, kind of the classic equality versus equity visualization. And I know there's lots of problems with this visualization. You know, why aren't they in the stands? Why aren't they playing the game? But I'm including it to uh, contrast with this modification from Abigail Echo Hawk from the Urban Indian Health Institute. Oops. Pardon me. You know, self determine. You know, what if we don't want to watch or play the game? What if the ideal outcome is something completely different? So, my personal research focuses on Indigenous children with disabilities, and a commonality between Indigenous uh, communities and disabled communities is that necessity of self determination and kind of participation, being able to, to determine what an ideal outcome is for themselves and what makes them healthy. And that um, was part of the work that I'd done. This was published uh, almost two years ago now in the Archives of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation. And in order to better understand disability and rehabilitation amongst American Indian and Alaska Native kids, I conducted a qualitative research study with Native kids with disabilities and their parents with the questions that were framed around the ICF model. And what we found kind of from during that analysis was that similar to research with other native populations, participants shared how cultural activities and participation in cultural community activities were an essential part of health for people from their tribal community. You know, and one participant said, you know, health and culture are all under one umbrella. However, they also shared how their child's functional impairments limited not only their child's participation in cultural activities, but the whole families. One mother shared, you know, kids dig the clams to learn the traditional ways, but she wasn't able to go to the beach in her wheelchair. Now, all of you probably know that there are wheelchairs designed specifically for beach access. When I asked the, uh, this child's mother about this, she said that she'd never heard of a beach wheelchair. It had never been addressed in any of her child's rehabilitation encounters in any setting. So just like with the beach wheelchair, for the other participants in the study, their barriers to participation in cultural and community activities often had potential rehabilitation solutions, whether it was equipment, working on a specific activity, working on kind of modifications to that activity. But for the most part, the rehab services didn't address the child or family's participation in cultural activities. They didn't uncover those functional goals that were related to the cultural activities, and therefore there was no work done to minimize those barriers to participation. So rehab providers, you know, this group with an expertise in function and enhancing participation, didn't know about those cultural needs related to the cultural, uh, the functional needs related to that cultural activity. And the parents didn't feel empowered to bring it up. So the rehab services were missing this key opportunity to help Native children with disabilities obtain their optimal function and health. So in my next research project, I, got, I wanted to gather more perspectives. So I interviewed additional stakeholders, 
about culturally centered rehabilitation services for indigenous children. <clears throat> and while this focused on indigenous children uh, specifically, many of the concepts that um, came out of this would, I, I would bet money that they'd apply to other kind of um, minoritized and excluded populations as well. So in this study, I interviewed uh, adult patients with, um, with disabilities, with uh, some more native parents, rehab providers and prescribers of rehab services, and then tribal community leaders who work with children and families. And the suggested components of a culturally centered rehab program included incorporating traditional cultural activities directly into the rehab activity, um, empowering parents and patients to direct their care and bring up things that were important to them, and then specific tools to help providers and families communicate about what those cultural and uh, cultural needs are and their functional goals related to culture. Part of that, you know, the, the barriers to culturally centered rehab care from this study was first off, just the lack of access, geographic access and um, transportation access and funding access to rehab services. Providers lack of knowledge about native cultures. Some of the providers brought up feeling unsure, being able, uh, knowing how to ask questions about the, you know, the child and family's indigenous culture that they didn't know, um, didn't have any familiarity with, and then a lack of trust. Kind of going back to that idea of the provider's lack of knowledge about native cultures, I saw a really great um, kind of encapsulation of this um, from an educational education professor named uh, Dr. Baker who coined this as translational exhaustion. And so indigenous people or any marginalized group that it's engaging with the larger population on any subject related to bias, first has to set the stage in terms of the historical context. So you know, all the way back to, to you know, 1491, and then bring it all the way to the current day state of affairs before they can even address the said topic of bias due to the lack of education and Kind of understanding that the listener has, and that this is a direct impact of the erasure of true indigenous history beyond the kind of cursory mention in elementary schools, which usually ends um, in the 1830s with like the Trail of Tears. So facilitators for culturally centered care included earning and maintaining trust and trustworthiness. Having more direct support from elders and from the community for children with disabilities, the ability of rehab services to be flexible in their delivery, so both flexible in the location of care, but also the timing of care, and then having more Indigenous or American Indian and Alaska Native rehabilitation professionals. I want to focus more now on kind of the trust and trustworthiness aspect because that's a key part of trauma-informed care, which is something that I think all healthcare systems should be thinking about because, and this is something that I remember from, from Dr. Ross Hayes, who was in our uh, rehab division for so many years, and he, he was giving a talk about how he always tries to remember that healthcare providers choose to enter into the relationship but families and patients don't like they're they're there. They, they they would rather not have to be there, but because something happened to their kid, they're there, and that's a trauma. And so, kind of honoring it as a trauma and providing trauma informed care for all of our patients is important, and even more so for people who've experienced the types of traumas that get counted as adverse childhood experiences now. And so, the kind of key tenets of trauma informed care are you know patient empowerment, choice collaboration, safety, and trustworthiness. And trustworthiness, um, I'm gonna start with the picture here. You're like, in a trust fall, you can't expect the person to fall if they don't know the person catching them is behind them. So we can't expect people, our patients, the families that we're trying to serve to trust us, to trust the systems that we represent as healthcare providers if we don't show that we are trustworthy, it's something that we have to earn to show that we're worthy of confidence and that we're dependable. 
And trustworthy is often described kind of at the individual level, the individual attributes of you know being accessible and approachable and respectful. But the Rand Corporation uh, last year did a you know a study kind of more at the institutional components of trust and distrust, which were not healthcare specific, but um, apply to healthcare situations, of course, and you know being competent, delivering and you know, knowing what you're doing. Uh, having high levels of integrity, doing what you say you're going to do, performing well, being accurate and being transparent, uh, which I think all large institutions can make progress in, in these areas. And then also the kind of this component of, of trustworthiness and thinking about it from an institutional level plays into the, this idea of an equ equitable systems. And so Scott and DeRosier um, kind of created this model, this framework of equitable systems on their equity systems continuum. So there's three different levels. The first level is thinks about healthcare systems as savior design. So this is kind of the you know traditional, you know, old school healthcare system where there's um, kind of not a lot, you know, not as much autonomy. This health, this type of healthcare doesn't consider at all those root causes or even the kind of systems and policies that are in place that drive disparities. You know, these systems have policies and practices that harm specific groups and benefit others, and that they're not they're not being explored or addressed at all. And in these types of systems, the individual or the families are blamed for the poor outcomes. They're labeled being non-compliant or difficult. You know, and this type of healthcare, you know, you can think of it as being delivered to vulnerable communities by members of privileged or oppressing communities um, as well. So it's kind of like the savior design and you know, the stereotypical healthcare from like the 50s would fall into this. <clears throat> I think where a lot of healthcare systems are now is what we'd call ally designed. So an ally is trying to build self-awareness among you know as as part of a privileged group while partnering with an oppressed group to spark that change. You know, they're trying to recognize the you know the unique circumstances of the individual or the family, the, the community. They're trying to think about the social determinants of health. They're, they're identifying those systematic and you know, kind of uh, institutional points of oppression and those policies and practices that are causing harm. And they're uniting with the oppressed or the excluded groups to change the system. But the system is still kind of working within the, you know, the, the confines of that original savior model. There haven't been any shifts in distribution of power. And there's not equitable representation of the, you know, of the voices at the table, um, but there's still progress that's being made. And I feel like over the past decade is really where that shift from being savior designs to ally designed has started to, to be known. And then some some groups and some some organizations are moving towards the equity empowered system. So this is where the of the, the care is designed and governed to center the oppressed group or the underprivileged group, the vulnerable group. Your resources are distributed so that decisions and implementation can be done in the most equitable equitable way. You know, that's the the if you think back to the the tree model, it's where the wires and the you know the um, planks are pulled in to make the tree come closer to the, the uh, oppressed group. And these types of systems are addressing those root causes. They're amplifying the lived experiences of the people who are most affected, and they're providing trauma-informed care. So, what can you do? <clears throat> this is not a complete list. These are just my ideas as well, too. So I think the first important thing to do is to educate yourself, to, to think about where you are, in your journey of understanding your own biases, to uh, expanding your knowledge of, of other groups. Uh, when it's safe to do so from a COVID perspective, you know, attending community events and cultural events from a wide variety of communities, you know, listening and asking questions. Um, 
definitely acknowledge the competing needs that the family, the children and families that we're caring for are facing. You know, adding in twice daily stretching. Is that really going, you know, is that going to help the overall family, you know, thinking about how that fits into their schedule and what the other challenges that, that they're facing are and how do we help them meet those basic needs? And there's, I think, been a lot of work on kind of screening for food insecurity and home ins uh, you know, housing insecurity. Um, I've seen it more at the primary care level and the primary care literature, and I think there's a place for that in specialty care as well. I think that we need to recognize and rebalance the power differentials. Uh, and there's a there's an epistemologic framework for this and epistemic justice, which is a whole other talk that you can you can have. But thinking about how power is created and how healthcare providers who are imbued with a lot of power based on training can consciously cede that power back to the families. I think all of us need to assess the environment that we've created and that we participate in and make changes where we can, like um, kind of calling back to the to the uh, parent panel earlier this morning. I think all of us who are Seattle Children's employees should be advocating very strongly for adult size changing tables in all of our facilities. Um, Next, you know, we as individuals need to be trustworthy and we also need to challenge our institutions to do the same. And then I think we all need to question where our systems are on that equity systems continuum and think about how we can work together to move our institutions to the next level. So in summary, you know, systemic injustices impact health, rehabilitation and education practice and the lived experiences of children with cerebral palsy and their families. Equality does not equal equity, does not equal justice. And I would like all of us to, to think about what justice would look like for children with cerebral palsy. Let's work to implement trauma-informed practices and move toward equity-empowered systems. And thank you very, very much. Molly, that was so good. Thank you so much for sharing your your your. That was really wonderful. Thank you, guys. Um, let's open it up for questions. I bet there are a few for you. I do have one question. Let me share my screen really quick. And um, just a reminder, folks. Um, there is a link at the bo bottom below your Vimeo player if you want to submit any more any questions for our speakers. Um, and this is the question that came up from Molly. Um, thank you so much for sharing your, your expertise and um, I am wondering how you talk to families about school choice when they ask, do you think this furthers class based inequities and seg uh, segregation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so like. School choice is such a. There's so many, so many family um, things that go into school choice and so. And I, my like personal bias with school choice too is like I, you know, I, I grew up in an area that didn't have choices. At the time that I was in my school district, we had the the lowest graduate graduation rate and the highest teen pregnancy rate in the state of Oregon. So I had kind of have this feeling like, oh, the the school system, you know, it matters, but not as much as the, what the family is doing to help the child. And so. I have to t take myself out of that bias because in a place like Seattle or kind of a more urban area where there are lots of choices, uh, I just try to I try to help family ask families questions to help them identify what their goals are and what their priorities are. Um, if they have other children, is it important for them to keep their children together in the same school? Um, and then, you know. Um, and I think there is a lot of kind of class based inequity and segregation with that school choice piece, too, because like, for instance, in the Seattle public schools, if you don't choose your neighborhood school or if you qualify for a special program, the special program that's associated with your neighborhood, the school district doesn't provide transportation. So families who don't have somebody at home who can take you know, drive the child to school have to stick with what they've got. They can't they can't be transported to another another area. And so 
there's a lot of a lot of points where inequity can be raised um, and kind of thinking about it from the other aspect too, you know, not just children with IEPs, but children who have, um, you know, the highly capable cohorts and, you know, choosing to, to put your children into the, those settings, which, you know, I admit that my, both my kids are in that cohort and we, we did that for a variety of reasons and uh, there's no easy answers about, about school choice. But we do try to think about how it's contributing to to class disparities. And my oldest could give a great soliloquy about the lack of diversity in um, particularly the Cascadia highly capable cohort school. Yes, um, schools are tough. Um, and I think you mentioned something about the PTA and emails about fundraising. Um, I, I'm not in that system yet, but I I've, I get the emails and I was like, wow, that's we're here. <laughs> um, so there's another question. Do you think that a single payer healthcare system is part of the answer to some of these health disparities? Yes, I do. Strongly. And I, I think that um, not, and it, thinking too, like like children, you have it better. Like children with public insurance have it better than adults with public insurance. So adults with public insurance get six visits of PT, six visits of OT, and six visits of speech therapy in a year. If they have an injury for two years after their injury, they get, it gets increased to 12 visits per year. But, you know, that's, insane that's not nearly enough um you know it's sets up such an incredible disparity for for people who are relying on the the public system and if there was an you know a, a payment rate that everybody got regardless of you know the the socioeconomic status of their the patients they were treating then yeah more people would accept the rate when i did the the audit study a couple of years ago, uh, we pre we pretended to be parents of a child with a traumatic brain injury calling to get services, and so many of the the like receptionists who talked to us were so sorry when they couldn't provide care, and they would say like you know we used to accept Medicaid but we just couldn't anymore we couldn't keep up with the uh, you know the 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 cost of keeping the practice open. And they would give us, you know, a few other clinics to call that did accept Medicaid, but that just kind of shows how how much has to be done still. And I know that some some practices, some clinics that do accept Medicaid, will do a lot of fundraising so that they can 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 keep doing that, that they can keep providing equitable care. And that's that's not the answer to equity. Having a a uniform system is would be so helpful so that's part of our role too like you know being advocates being active voting absolutely um here's a question about trauma-informed care can you expand a bit on um trauma-informed care practices yeah so i think trauma-informed care first grew out of uh Kind of more of the mental health part of healthcare services, and did focus initially more on people who've experienced individual traumas. So you know, people who've experienced abuse or had something bad happen to them to where they weren't trusting of systems anymore, and has expanded to other areas of care too. Um, and I think one of the underpinnings of trauma-informed care um, is that it's trying to acknowledge all of the events and history not of the of the individual too, like what happened to them that's kind of molded their behavior in the way that they're presenting to you now instead of like thinking, oh, what's wrong with that person? 
it's what happened to you and how can we help reshape the behaviors so the trauma is not the so that we're not perpetuating the trauma and I closed my slides so I can't go back to them but there has been a lot of scholarship on trauma-informed care <clears throat> so I think you have the slides in the handout so you can see the the reference um, for the trauma-informed care paper uh, but there are kind of those those key the key tenets of you know collaboration and shared decision making of choice so we're we're people truly feel like they have a choice that we're not pigeonholing them into or or kind of shoehorning them into a certain direction but the, that they know kind of what all of the tools in the toolbox all the tool what the tools in the toolbox um, kind of what's out there and that they can choose which tools they grab um, which I think is can be uncomfortable for for providers when we feel like what we're offering isn't being accepted um, or if we would choose make a different choice but I think the, the most important thing is it's not our choice unless you're making the decision for yourself or for your dependent it's not your choice what uh, what the person does and um, you know it's their goals that matter and then the, the other bit of trauma-informed care that I didn't talk about much was the safety aspect and so how we can make our environments both our physical environments but our social environments kind of safer and more welcoming for for patients and families and more inclusive and so that's things like having you know welcoming messages in a variety of languages uh, I feel like that's often implemented with with written messages and what about our families who don't read English or read read in their their native language that's things like having uh, appropriate lighting you know the, the the feeling of safety with how um, how much does your security check-in come across as as police driven versus just you know a security check and I, I feel like that's some some work that can be done at, at the institutional levels make, making making security seem less like a police force um, the lighting in exam rooms, you know, the availability of of changing tables. Uh, one negative change that I've seen at Seattle Children's recently is a lot of our exam rooms no longer have high low tables, and Hoyer lifts don't fit under them, and so it's harder to transfer patients to the exam table now to to truly do an exam and provide that same standard of care that we we provide other children, and so. But those are some of the physical aspects. The social aspects of safety in trauma informed care are kind of a consistency of messaging, um, respect across all, you know, all people that you encounter from the, the greeter or the, the cleaning person to you know, the MA, the, the resident, the fellow, the attending, the nurse, you know, everybody should be kind and, and respectful of, of the patient and family. And, ideally getting that reciprocally back from the, the patients and families as well. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of other literature out there on trauma-informed care. Um, could be a whole nother talk as well. Hey Molly, this is Emily. I, I Could you speak a little bit, not just about um, individualized trauma, but historical trauma as oh. this informs um, um, the care that we provide in our yeah. community? Because I think people kind of understand, like if you've yeah. experienced child abuse or or something, yeah. but what that racism yeah. and institutional racism is a trauma too. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for for bringing that up. I actually have a whole other hour long talk on historical trauma and Native communities and how it impacts healthcare. So I'll try to give you the the two minute version. Um, I think that. Kind of start, thinking back to like kind of the socio ecological model and you have your, your end of your child and then there's their family and beyond the family there's the community and then the historical community people talk to each other within their community and so if if something bad has happened to a member of the community at a certain institution everybody else in that community is going to know that and that's going to get told to you know the the grandchildren and it's going to get perpetuated if it's not changed think kind of thinking about it so that's like kind of more 
community level um, trauma. For historical trauma, that's like the generational trauma. Um, the work that's been done for indigenous communities was spearheaded by Maria Yellow Horse Bray Part. And um, kind of talking about that experience of, of genocide, both actual genocide and loss of life for native population for native communities, but then also the cultural genocide that was attempted in the kind of the late 1800s with um, with boarding schools, with the loss of traditional practices. So in the, the late 1800s, 1884, um, native religious practices were outlawed. Basically, since religion covered so many aspects of life, that was the healthcare practices as well, too. And so for over, for uh, almost 100 years until the American Indian Religious Freedom Act, there was you were you could be prosecuted and put in jail for practicing your religion and your traditional health care. And so that kind of impacted impacts the interaction with the Western health care services. And then the you know the Western healthcare services and the Indian Health Service have have done great disservices and harms to Native families. You know, in the the 60s and the 70s, um, there is a study that was done that anywhere from, you know from 25 percent up to 75 percent of the permanent sterilization procedures that were done on Native women were done inappropriately. So either coerced without consent at all, or, you know, otherwise done wrongly. And which is really hard to think about because, you know, my that's the, the kind of the age cohort of my dad, who's where I get my native heritage from. And if my dad had been my mom or a woman, like would he have had a, a sterilization procedure um, performed on him without his consent, leading to, to, you know, me not existing. And so, the healthcare system and health research has been used against people, against against native groups, against other other um, kind of marginalized groups. I think there's lots of stories about you know, for for black uh, black people as well too, where it's not just like an individual racist provider, but the whole healthcare system that did these horrible things to people and that's not trustworthy and that's not trusting. And so we we as healthcare providers have to show you know, that's kind of where that trustworthiness comes in. Like we have to, even though it might not have been us who did it, we need to make up for those systems that did do it in the past. Basically healthcare reparations. Yeah, I, I was just thinking of of you know me as a white person. I am the I am the face of the medical institution from when I walk through the door of a of a patient room, and what that might represent to a white person versus a native person are completely yeah. different things. And to acknowledge yeah. that my race is an an incredibly big influence yeah. on the interaction is really important. And I think the other piece that has to be said, particularly for Native patients, I don't know for the other um, groups because I haven't looked at that data, uh, but there's such a high number of Native children with special health care needs with disabilities who are in non-Native foster or adoptive homes. Um, and how many times, you know, how thinking about how the role of the healthcare system in kind of those CPS calls and family training, and how you know, we just need to always make sure that families are given true opportunities to show to to learn and to learn in the way that works for them, and to have the support before we remove children from their homes, which. And their communities. And their communities, yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. It's very, it's very common. We see it, I see it anecdotally in my practice all the time in terms of where kids are placed in foster care. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, Molly. That was just a really wonderful um, 
presentation.